especially with everything y'all got going on and being so super awesome in the community. So I got a couple of questions for you guys. Sorry, so I had spinal surgery and the surgery for a lot of Wow. Whoa.
I graduated law school at the age of 46. And I know you all think I'm just 46 now. <laughs> but I've been practicing for 22 years. I do family law, domestic violence, dependency law, that's when the state comes in and takes your kids, and some civil litigation. I've been a guardian ad litem since 2002, and a guardian ad litem, you get appointed by the judges to represent the best interests of the child. You're the ears and the mouthpiece for the child. I'm also involved so much within the community in mental health and drug addiction. I don't know if you've heard of NAMI, National Alliance of Mental Illness. I'm former president and vice president for the Broward Division. Mm. I also volunteer and I teach a class to family members for relatives that suffer from mental illness and drug addiction. It's free, I don't get paid for it, and I'm also state certified so I can go around the state of Florida and teach other people to do what I do. I was also president of my Kiwanis in Deerfield Beach for two separate terms, um, and I also belong to the Daniel Lions Club. Unfortunately, three and a half years ago, I came down with cancer. I'm cancer free now. Um, <laughs> from everything that I was doing. So I'm just getting back now, and I'm back to teaching my class for NAMI. So the legal news starts tomorrow. There's only one rota on the ballot, so I'm asking for you to vote, either during early voting or August 23rd, vote a soft on the circuit court judge, group 23. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you. My name is Kate Early, and I am a product of the criminal justice system. I know this is FRRC, and you all strive to get ex-cons back into society. Well, thank goodness is that not only am I back into society, I have contributed to society. 18 years ago, I was in a solitary confinement in a jail cell while I was pregnant with my son. And I was there because I broke the law. I was working at a shoe store and I gave away discounts to my friends who came in and not only was I fired, I was arrested. I went through the criminal justice system and I thought my dreams of becoming a lawyer was over. 18 years later, I stand before you named top 10 attorney for criminal defense by the National Trial Lawyers Association, top 40 under 40, top 10 for the National Trial Lawyers Association for customer service and personal injury. <laughs> you all don't understand how hard uh, and how much work you have to do from being incarcerated, from having the stigma of being in handcuffs, mm -hmm. having a mugshot, mm. having my arrest report look, uh, researched don't get this by research. people, and putting it out there in society and making it seem like you can't trust her. Once you do the time, you think that you're, it's over, right? But it's not. So don't take it lightly what I've accomplished in, in uh, 18 years, because not a lot of people I wanted to become judge so that I can not only influence others that there's life beyond incarceration, but also we need diversity on the bench. Out of 90 judges in Broward County, there are only six black females. That is not representation of our community, and that is not diversity on the bench. So on August 23rd or earlier, I want everyone to vote early for early. My last name is early, so I want you all to say it together. Early. Wait. <laughs> on August, I want everyone to vote early for early. Thank you. <laughs> we unfortunately were just joking around. We all could probably get up here and do each other's speeches because we've been to so many. So that last part was the part that I was going to do before, remember? But, but I'm not allowed to do it because we're not allowed to endorse each other. And I'm Latina, so I can move ahead too. Okay. okay. Uh, Lorena Mascherigo, I'm running for circuit court judge. So everybody in Broward gets to vote for us. None of us are in the same race. Okay? So well, two of you. She's got an opponent that's not here. They're here. She doesn't have somebody that's here. He doesn't have his opponent here, and I don't have my opponent. Um, I left my card on your, on your desk, on your chairs. I've been practicing for 23 years. Um, most of it has been as a criminal defense attorney with the Public Defender's Office in Broward County. I've done everything in that office, everything. Mm -hmm. I left for five years to make more money. I met the hubby, which was a plus. 
but then I didn't feel how do you say it back there? <laughs> so the last name, the last name is wrong because of him. Um, I felt too much like a business person though in the private sector. So mm -hmm. after we gave birth to our son, I went back to public service and I've been there since. It's been 13 years now. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't feel useful in the private sector. I mean, the money was beautiful. I'm not going to lie, but everything else just felt like a transaction, not like the connection with the community. Mm -hmm. So I now train attorneys in my office for the last four years. That's all I do because I've done over 50 jury trials, over 50 bench trials. I've always been in the trenches, so now I'm trying to pass it on. Uh, like it was passed on to me, I'm trying to pass it on. I also teach at Nova Law School as well, and I'm teaching the same thing, trial advocacy at Nova Law. Um, I'm very passionate about my community, and I've been involved in it since I moved to the U.S. when I was eight years old, from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Remember, I'm Latina, that's what I said before. So I've always been involved in my community, not just now for the election, and I'll continue being involved. And I've done it with the Hispanic community, with Big Mom of Team of Life. Uh, she claims both of my children. She had a dream that I was pregnant, and uh, for both of them, I found out I was pregnant a week later, so I'm <laughs> telling you that woman has the sense. So um, I just wanna now bring it to the bench, um, because I know from all sides, and I know my community, and we need more judges on the bench than in our community. And Hispanics on the bench, females and males right now, we only have five. Mm. Out of nine. How sad is that? So please remember, remember Lorena. Diversity counts. Lorena, group 51. Diversity yeah. counts. I'm like, nobody has anybody here. I forgot you. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. See, that's what I'm talking about. I am Tanya Maria Williams, and I want to be your next circuit court judge. Yes. Rhoda Sokoloff is my opponent, along with Gary Farmer. Here's why I am your best choice. In December 1989, I was sitting in the back of a courtroom. I was 11 years old. I was sitting with my mom, who was 29, my sisters, who were five and six. My father stood at the podium as a defendant. It was a drug charge. We're standing in a courtroom in Connecticut, and we're from Brooklyn. Mm. This judge, looks at us, does not look like us, and says to my father, Mr. Williams, I know you want to go home for Christmas. I see your family back there, and I know they want you home, but that is not going to happen. That's what he said to a woman and her three kids. That is what he looked at us and measured us as. Mm -hmm. Not being worthy enough to get compassion, equity, and objectivity. Instead, he was condescending and dismissive. Mm. At that very moment, I decided I needed to be a judge. Mm -hmm. Not I just wanted to be a judge, but I needed to be a judge. Because the next little 11-year-old girl should never have that feeling. The next little 11-year-old girl should be able to see herself sitting on that bench. So I charted a path, and I became a prosecutor in Orlando. My father gave me crap for it. Tell you, how you going to do that? How you going to lock black men up after everything you've seen? And I told him, it's because of everything I've seen. I grew up in a building in Brooklyn where the owner of it was on American Most Wanted. I remember that Friday night when they raided the building, and I saw a cop standing outside my building with a rocket launcher on his shoulder. I remember my mom coming to the door with the cops behind her just to make sure she was saying what she was saying because her three kids were alone in that apartment. I am the rose that grew from concrete. I tell women every day, you are not where you come from, and you can be whatever you want to be. I've been a lawyer for 20 years. The oil of is just working very well, but I turned 24 <laughs> on Monday. I've done criminal, I've done civil, I've done more trials than everybody else in my juries and non juries But most importantly, I want to treat people like people. I've been on the other side of the bench. For lawyers and judges walking into that courtroom, it's a day at work. For the person walking into that courtroom that's not a lawyer or a judge, that's their worst day. And we need people who understand that. We need people who will respect that, and we need people who will treat people like people. And that's why I'm asking you, that 11-year-old girl, her name is on your ballot. Dark in the circle. Good evening. Uh, my name is 
Alex Sariaka. I am running for circuit court judge in group 14. As like Lorena was telling me, I could, I could give you the background with my experience. Look at my gray hair, I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing about having gray hair, it speaks for itself. Yes. And, you know, Tanya was just teasing me <laughs> of our speech, and my stick was talking about the disconnect, which is, which is kind of interesting, because this is probably the last group that we started uh, voting. And let me ask you something. I'm going to change it up a little bit. I've been talking about that the problem with the system. I've been doing this for 30 years. I love being a lawyer. You know what happened? One day I got really sick of watching people get chewed up in a courtroom. And you know what? You know what the realization that I came to? That if we, the, the, in the court system, it's 85% minorities. People argue with me. I'm there every day. I will, I will die telling you this. It's mostly minority people that are going through this. Unless we get our people on that bench, we keep getting chewed up, okay? People keep getting chewed up. And the thing about what I do, is there was probably a defense attorney like me standing next to you guys when that road horror started for you. And then you have to try to fight back. Now tell me something. Do I really have to preach to you guys that there's a disconnect in the court system? Absolutely not. not okay? I know that. And and the only way, the only way when you, when you, and I have, you know, I don't even want to say that because my, my, my opponent isn't here, but, and I don't even have nothing against him, but how could he, how could he understand? It is us, it's the minority community that if we don't take the bench, we cannot wait for them, okay, to do the right thing. Look at history. Truth. Okay? We have to put our own up there that understand the background. Okay? And like I said, it was, it's funny because you guys are probably the only group that I don't have to preach about a disconnect because you know <laughs> it. That's right. Okay? So when it comes to voting, okay, it starts here. You guys, with, you have the power. That's where it starts. Okay? And you get a lot of discouragement because when you have the power with these groups and you're getting the power to vote back, okay? And that's why people show up here because they want your vote. That's how valuable it is, okay? So you know what? It's time to take that, take it and take control of our community and allow our people to be judged by our people, okay? Not by somebody else's standard of what they think it should be. So, when early voting starts, I don't have any little gimmick to you to tell you to vote for me. Just look at Alan Sariata. Okay? I've been doing this for 30 years. I've been, sta I've been standing next to people like you guys. When that hammer came down and it, to and it totally changed your life, I, I take my hat off to you joining these groups and making the effort to come back. But it shouldn't, you should not have the system fighting you. And you should have people up there that understand that everybody deserves a second chance. But use use your power to vote to take it, okay? Yes, sir. Because they're not going to give it to you. All right? True. Years, they're not going to give it to you. <laughs> okay? So you vote for Alex Ariasa starting tomorrow. Okay? okay. All right. What is the schedule? Give us a time limit. Because I can talk. I can talk to you. Yes, you can. I just want to be fair. I'll keep a strong timer. A minute per question? Yes. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I'll see you finish the question. Okay. Because I'm going to start with Alex Ariaka. Alex Ariaka. Alex Ariaka.
first thing, and really the, the motivating force that made me go and become a candidate was, you know, people, I guess you have to be in court to really experience the disrespect that judges show towards I mean, you know what? I'm starting, I, I would start to think that they had become so insensitive about the people that were coming before them. They just, they're, they don't care. And they have to start to care right from the beginning. So as simple as listen to the person, they have something to say, hear them out, understand that what happens, especially you value their life like you do other people. And I, and I guess, you know, most defense attorneys and you guys, you understand where, where you, when you go through this, What's wrong with the court system? Two things. The first thing is procedural, where it's not as efficient as it needs to be, especially with the backlog that we have, because Broward County was shut down for a year, because that was a good idea. Um, I know with the pandemic, we had no choice in certain things, but it really has created a backlog that needs to be cleared out. And we have to give the attorneys, um, mainly on the criminal side, the prosecutors and the PDs, the opportunity to actually work some of these cases out, because they're carrying too many cases. On the human side, because one of the things I keep saying is the whole is only as good as the sum of its parts. That's what they taught us in geometry. Well, this whole, its parts are human. And we need a better understanding of a conscious bias. We need to understand that, yes, racism is a form of bias that needs to be eradicated. But there is a form of unconscious bias that we need to be more aware of on the bench. Mm -hmm. For example, OK, never mind. There you go. We got to fix those two things. <laughs> and next.
primarily family law. And I have to tell you, because of the pandemic, we're still doing our hearings via Zoom. We're not back in the courthouse. And there's such a backlog. I have a client that I was trying to get her a child support hearing. I called up about two months ago. The first available date was December. I'm thinking, what is she going to do from like April, May till December when the father's not paying any child support? There's got to be something that's done. If I'm your judge, I promise you I will come in early and I will stay late to try to catch up with the doctors. And as far as um, some of the judges, some of the judges that are on the bench really are really rude to the litigants and to uh, the lawyers. And some of them don't know the law. So that's been my experience. And I promise you, I will do the best I can for you. Not that I'm feeling bashed at all of being the only sitting judge sitting here. <laughs> As because they talk about how our bench is. Um, Broward County, I mean, judges are human, so you're going to have a mixed bag. Uh, as far as backlogs go, um, we're doing the best we can. Um, I can tell you that as a practitioner, I remember I was predominantly a family law practitioner, and it was frustrating to have to wait months and months and months. I will say, even as a sitting judge, I'm a little shocked that from April to December, uh, when I was on the family bench, that was that wore on me tremendously. But I was fortunate enough for whatever reason, my dockets. People didn't wait more than three to four months for a hearing because I knew. So I would be in the courthouse till 7.30 at 8 at night working on orders because I would spend all the day, daytime hours making sure there were hearings. Uh, I sit on the foreclosure bench now, so it's it's always doing, but we are doing the best we can. There, there is a backlog, but we are under certain mandates. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> to, to 
to make sure that you treat everybody equally that comes before you. You follow the law, and the same law applies to everybody, no matter black, white, whatever you are. The same law applies. Well, I'm going to answer it. Wait, it starts my time. <laughs> I reclaim my time. <laughs> I'll answer it together because it's more of action instead of a philosophy. Because we hear this time and time again. We hear it during politics, we hear it at campaign rallies and protest movements. We hear that it's supposed to be justice for all, equality for all, and uh, justice is not supposed to be attached to any form of financial status or your race. We hear it a lot. But the question is, do we see it? And obviously we don't. We know that there's a disparity with sentencing specifically amongst minorities, and why is that? We have to look at the root of the problem. The root of the problem is the bench. How is it that we, there's, there's no other explanation, because if we have this continuous um, increase of incarceration, specifically for minorities, then who is sentencing uh, or doing the sentencing? We have judges. Now, half of the terms are mandatory sentences where the judges have no discretion. But the other half, judges have discretion. So again, it goes back to having diversity on the bench. Not just black people, we need um, other, other, uh, diversity, other minorities on the bench so that we can get closer to social justice. Instead of it being a philosophy, it can be reality. Amen. <clears throat> Welcome to any criminal courtroom, and you will see the majority of the people that are in custody are minorities. And it's because they can't afford the bond. Okay? And that goes along with sentencing. There was one case in the courthouse a few years back where two individuals, one was a rich white male, one was a Hispanic male. Both had gone drunk, both drove, both killed pedestrians. The white male had a lot of money and in a civil lawsuit paid the family of the deceased a lot of money. He got out on supervision. The Hispanic male had no money, he got sentenced to prison. And it happens. And yes, there's all types of reasons to go below the guidelines and if the family gets that restitution since they lost money, but that shouldn't be the only reason. They both committed the same crime in the same way. The Hispanic actually stayed with his car until the cops came. The white male left. <clears throat> so that happens in that courthouse every day. We have a judge right now that's on the bench that got bad uh, arguments against her because she called out her prosecutors for sentencing two people charged with the same thing different. And everybody came up in arms. She did the right thing. And we need more of those judges. And we need people to realize it. If you have two people that do the same crime, it shouldn't matter that this guy has a lot of money and this guy doesn't. That's true. That's right. Okay, so what social justice means to me is that justice in society should not differ because of what I look like, where I come from, or how much money I make. Um, I should have the same opportunities as someone in Parkland, as someone in Victoria Park. Um, that's what social justice means to me. What the role I think the judiciary plays, I'm a little different in that I think it's not just the judiciary, because it's the police departments and the sheriffs that are charging them and bringing them in. It's the state attorney who makes that charging decision. So by the time you get to a judge, their hands are partially tied, but not full. So the job of the judge is now to look at what you're doing. How are you sentencing people? How are you treating people? And I'll tell you something I did in my 36 seconds as a prosecutor. A black man was stopped by an officer for doing 69 in a 70. First of all, how is that a problem? Second of all, I'm looking at him because he now has a felony charge based on this stop. I dismissed that case because it was wrong. That was not justice. That was not something that should have been done. He was stopped incorrectly, and I should not further that problem. So as a judge, I should not further that problem. Mm -hmm. if, if there is something that has to be done based on what the sentencing guidelines say, you have to follow the law. You don't have that choice. But you can look at people as people. You know, um, 
That's such a that's such an interesting word throughout my career. I hear that social justice. And you know what, the older you get, you know how you change with that, right? As a, as a defense attorney, I can tell you midway through, when I saw the things that they're talking about, the disproportionate sentencing, as a lawyer, I said, you know what, I'm not, I'm not gonna take this. Whatever they're gonna, whatever they're gonna do, whatever I'm gonna get punished, I'm not gonna take this from a judge, and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna take them to task. And they came close to getting in trouble a few times. And, but you know what? But the problem is, is the people in that courtroom actually don't even realize that they have the power. Because some of these judges, you know, there was a rule a long time in Broward County, you don't want to get the sitting judge. They just made that rule up, okay? They just made that thing up themselves. And, and for years, you couldn't, you couldn't go against the sitting judge. But they made up that rule, and they made everybody believe that that was the way it is. And that judge was a god, and they're not. They're not. You guys get together. You get enough votes. I guarantee he's going to listen to you. Because now it's an elected position. It's not an elected one. That's right. So you can achieve social justice, but it takes a lot of hard work, but you can do it. You know, and I know you guys understand it because you formed this group. Now, what's the justice system? They're supposed to do the right thing. Okay? But you know what? I tell you, and I say it to this group, they ain't going to give it to you. Okay? You have they to should take do it. the right thing. But they're not going to give it to you unless you make them give it to you. And you can do that with the vote. Yes. <laughs> 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 so I do family law. Yeah. 
Um, I do domestic violence. I do dependency law, and I've done civil litigation. So if the judge puts me in any of those, I'm fine. However, I'm also, because of my mental health, um, in the community and teaching the class on mental health and drug addiction, I would love to be either in drug court or mental health court as well. Good. As the only sitting judge. <laughs> um, I, as a practitioner, I had prosecuted the criminal defense, domestic violence, family law, personal injury, did some probate, and as a sitting judge, I have done felony at state extradition. I have done um, uh, domestic violence, a little bit of delinquency. Uh, family law, I was uh, three years in family court, and now the last two and a half years, uh, residential foreclosure judge. So I've also, part of our duties are I do first appearance, so bond court, because we have both that we're, we have our assignment. Uh, I do um, RPOs, the so risk protection orders as well forfeiture order, so I have that background. I've done jury trials as well as bench trials, practicing, uh, but on the bench right now, the conditions I'm in, uh, I'm not sure trials and no jury trials. All right, Judge, looks like I'm going to have to do a time with you, too. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. My, my next question um, is, what do you guys think about the disciplinary system that exists for, let's say, rogue judges and officers? Um, I'm sure you're going to encounter that, uh, or have encountered that. Do you believe the system is adequate? No. <laughs> <laughs> what, what can change? What do you think will change about it? I may actually put a time on this. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what, though? The, uh, and, I, and I can answer that one pretty quickly. You know what? You had an interesting first question. You just when I keep preaching about the power that you have, you know who does decide who who goes over a certain court set, over a court? The chief judge. And guess what? This is an elected position too. And guess what he needs? He needs your vote. Hmm. And as long as you keep reminding him of that, they'll take you into consideration. Now the other part, when you when you gotta call them to task. When they do something wrong, one of the things that I do and I if I see a judge do something wrong and they're showing favoritism or something, I will I will file a motion to recuse immediately. Mm -hmm. I probably have filed more of those than I, anybody I know. And if I have to go further, but I, they are human beings. They are not God. You call them right. a task. You know, when you're a young lawyer, you think it's a big deal. You've got to do it. No, you don't. As the years show you, you know what? You call them a task. Because you know what? They got people above them too. So the JQC, um, the Judicial Qualifications Administration, um, that has changed. And the Judicial Ethics Commission has changed a lot just over the last five to ten years. There were times where um, the judge almost had to kill somebody to be removed from the bench. That is no more. They have gotten really serious about um, the investigating and, and acting, you know, there are, I don't want to disparage anybody, so I don't want to call names, but there are judges who have been removed because uh, they were dishonest in the investigation. There were, <laughs> you can call the names, I won't. Um, there were judges who were reprimanded because they let their anger get the best of them, because they did not act in a judicial capacity. The, the, light that is being cast on the judiciary by judicial conduct is being taken a little more seriously, I think, just based on what I've seen in the last couple of years. Um, is it a perfect system? No, because some of it is self-reporting. That's the way the legal, the lawyer system is. It's self-reporting, you know? So sometimes you'll go to a colleague and be like, hey, don't do that no more, instead of actually turning them in. So it's one of those things where everything has its flaws, but I do think it is coming a little further. You never started with forever. It's okay. I'll talk less than a minute. Um, we used to, a bunch of years back, used to have a uh, survey, a written survey that you could write on each judge, mm -hmm. and they stopped it. But now we have advanced so much with electronics, we should be able to have something like that where you can enter it 
anonymously mm -hmm. so that attorneys would actually say the truth about what they think mm -hmm. the performance of the judge is and the judge should be given all of those comments some of our judges i think will react because maybe some of them don't realize that they come across a certain way some of them unfortunately won't but i think that now with technology we should bring back that kind of survey and let attorneys actually answer questions and say what they truly think but anonymously so that the attorneys will actually say the Right. what they actually think and not be afraid that the judge is going to treat them poorly because they were honest about it. Mm -hmm. Give me 30 seconds. <laughs> Before the judges begin on the bench, be an informed voter. Make sure you are researching who's on the ballot because this right here, we can tell you anything. We can put a smile on our faces because we want your votes. So beyond this, you have the cards, use the internet. Talk to your neighbors because we as lawyers, we have the opportunity to actually sit in front of these judges. We know their personalities when they're in court. We know their personalities when it's not voting election season because some of them have some strange personalities on the bench, but then you see them on the campaign trail and they're like, you know, hey, I'm a friendly neighbor. No, you're not. So research them. That's every research me. Okay, see you early and you'll see all my stories. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, 40. I need of her time. I need like a minute and a half. I have a personal experience with a particular judge, and I'm not going to name the judge. Um, but for some reason, I think she doesn't like me. So, I had a hearing in front of her to try to get. Um, let's call it an exceptions hearing. I was trying to get my client her attorney's fees that should have been awarded to her. So the judge, when I I'm do my argument, the judge says to me, you're not doing this for your client, you're doing this for yourself. And I went, and I, I responded like, judge, I don't even know what to say. I don't know how to respond to that. Then another issue, she kept bringing up about child support. And I said, we're not here on child support. So she says, if your client would have gotten the cash app, I mean, since she didn't get the cash app, clearly she didn't need the money bad enough. So from that, I asked the judge to disqualify herself. She denied it. I took it one step further to the chief judge, and I wrote a letter, and I've never done that in my entire practice. And I don't know what the chief judge did. I think he just sent it to one of the, the chairs in the family division, one of the other judges. She became a little nicer to me for about two weeks, and then she went back to her normally nasty self. <laughs> so I didn't get any relief. A lot of us can relate to those things. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Judge Cutter. Judge Cutter. <laughs> I think the question was regarding the JQC. I know we drifted off of that, but I thought the question was regarding the JQC and how effective it is. Yeah, the, the okay. disciplinary system. The disciplinary system. Um, the, the JQC has evolved. I mean, I've watched the evolution of it where they're not taking, they're, they're taking very seriously now the issues that are being brought up and when the, um, Actually, I will say not as much the JQC as the Florida Supreme Court because the JQC has worked some deals that the Florida Supreme Court has rejected and wanted struck. So, and I acknowledge that the JQC sometimes will be a little more lenient, but the system is working because the final say is with the Florida Supreme Court. And what the what everybody's been talking about is that. In the last five or ten, I'm going to need more time if you want to actually get a real answer. Um, it, it's it's because I'm experiencing some of the issue of because we're going to get to the blog, the, the, the Google stuff in a second. Uh, but the the issue with the JQC is there's a check and balance of it because the Florida Supreme Court is the final say, and they are making sure that if there are deals that they don't think are adequate, they are coming back and doubling them. So there are some times that they're sanctioning that the, the Florida Supremes are moving. So the, the checks and balances right now are working. The Supremes are not taking uh, conduct of some judges 
uh, the same way, and they are the ones that make the final say. That's why you'll find that the JQC will make a recommendation, it goes to the, the, to the Supreme, the Supreme say, I don't like that deal. So now you're going to go back and get a trial on one record, and then we'll make the final decision. And a lot of times what you'll find is judges don't want that trial, and they'll resign. So there's been several that that is exactly happened, that they will resign rather than go to the trial. As to, and I'm going to bring up this because it's in a contested election right now, uh, as I told you, it's not a popular contest. So if you're going to go and Google, then I recommend that you really check the sources of your Google. There's a lot of fake news out there and disgruntled people. So, and I am right now the target of a vicious attack through uh, a uh, a, a, a defense attack that hurts society and can actually blame people for how they can do it. Google can do it. Um, one of the issues who's facing bar for attacking judges. I know that they're going to go on and 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 on
I understand sometimes you need time to think about it, so I'll come back another day with them in the courtroom and say your decision then, face to face, and explain it. Um, unfortunately, I have seen too many attorneys that don't explain things well to their clients, so I think that the judge should. They don't have to give any legal advice, but they could say, you know, uh, Mr. Smith, unfortunately, based on the record, based on the evidence, I think that, you know, the best thing for you or what might help you will be this. I hope you take it seriously, whatever it is, but actually take the time to have that human conversation with the person that is in front of them. And it's the same in family law and every other day. Right. I agree. I, mean, I used to be an assistant public defender and I worked uh, in front of the juvenile division. And this particular judge, before he rendered a sentence, he would always not only explain the sentence, but he would then uh, cite case law. So it transitioned from me being a lawyer to now I'm writing down this case law and then I will keep this case law because again, judges are supposed to rule based on the rule of law, not on their feelings, not on the person before them. So when a judge gives you, a, renders a decision and then backs it up with the law, although you felt like, okay, I lost or this motion was denied, you still know, okay, but it was based on the law. And I utilize that law for future cases when I'm, when I'm arguing a motion. Because I'm like, Your Honor, you use this law against my client, then I know this case law is on point for my client in a separate case. So that's all we want. We want an explanation from the judge so that we know that your rule is not based on your feelings, but based on the rule of law. Hmm. So in family court, because I don't do criminal, um, I've just gone through five trials in the last couple of months. So I just got slammed with trial after trial. And in one of the trials, thankfully my client did wonderful. And when the judge made his ruling, he actually said, I find this and this is why. Because there's statutory factors that they have to go through. So the judge explained that. Now in another one, I, it was another two-week trial. All she said, and it was actually general magistrate, said, your client didn't meet his burden. Your client didn't meet his burden, her burden. And, and that was it. So that when you don't get a, a ruling with the explanation and whatever the law is to support whatever the judge is going to rule, you can take an appeal. I mean, that leaves you open for an appeal. So, I, I, but I do believe that a judge, when they're going to make a ruling, if you're going to reserve, and I've had this happen, and I'm talking really, really fast, <laughs> they've called us. <laughs> They called us, both lawyers, and given the ruling and why on the telephone. As a sitting judge, I've just made it pretty much a policy. I don't reserve a ruling. I rule from, I rule on the, from the bench. So, because I believe that when they make their argument and they made their case, they should hear the reasons why I'm going to rule. And so I, and, and when I was on the family bench, family, um, the family rules really do require very much specificity. And in fact, um, one of my predecessors had volumes of reversals for that specific reason because the criteria wasn't laid out. So I was very careful to make sure when I made my ruling that the statutory reasons and explained all the reasons. If it was going to be a hard pill to swallow, there would be times when I had to go as far as custody or because of substance abuse or something that I explained. You have the, you have the power to make this right. Here's going to be the steps. And I would make out those steps for them. So I explained the law, but I didn't do that. Can you argue something that was a motivating thing? The problem with that when you ask is you let a bunch of judge run his mouth and they get stupid. <laughs> Stuff like what happened to Tanya. You see that? Like an 11 year old girl. It just happened to me. And they say nasty, mean things. So, me personally, you want to rule because when I've, I've had these experience when I let them run their mouth, they're going to say something stupid. <laughs> Okay, I have a question. Uh -huh. Probably two. <laughs> but, um, okay, I'm looking at the housing price scale of the judicial system. It's supposed to be balanced. Mm -hmm. And so I don't see the landlords being held accountable like tenants are. And I go and I do these court matches. So my question is, 
when, I mean, let me add to that. When I see these court, in court, lots of times the tenants who are pro se are representing themselves and don't, it's not being heard. The judge is not hearing them because they don't have an attorney beside them. So with those challenges of keeping the balance, what, I mean, I don't know which one is civil and has worked in civil, what changes do you see that you can make to make sure that it's balanced when it comes to evictions that are happening? So, it, it, whether it's the process, because I, I, I seem to think that the mediation needs to be before the landlord files it, the, the eviction to keep the case, but what changes do you see? So we can't, talk, we can't tell you how we would move on something because the rules don't allow us to do that. But that's a listening problem. Here's how I say that's a listening problem. Is that person representing themselves, they're, they're the party. They still have the right to be listened to. They have the right to be heard. That is the whole point. So you have a duty to listen to this party, let them present their case. And I think what happens is because judges are human, they get frustrated because it's not what they're used to. It's not a lawyer standing there presenting the legal argument in a linear way that they can process it very easily. It's a person who is in their worst day trying to communicate what they're thinking and what they're feeling. So that's a, you have to stop and listen. That's what you have to do. As far as the legal process, some of that's dictated by statute. And the judge can't get involved until there's a case. So as far as rearranging the order, that's not really something you might be able to do. I don't know, you know, but if, if that's not that you, then there's not much they'll be able to do. But, but they can fix the listening problem. And the judge should be able to explain. Right. The statute says that A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. So he has proven A, B, and C. So I'm sorry, Ms. Smith. Mm -hmm. Since they have proven A, B, and C, then I have no other power or choice, and I have to rule that way. So, and I think some judges sometimes forget that you're not an attorney, you need to go to law school, you don't do this every day, and they should take that extra five minutes to explain it instead of saying, I gotta finish my docket, I gotta move the cases along. You know, and, and again, we all try to finish stuff sometimes when we gotta go and we gotta see places, but when you're on the bench, it's different than now, okay? So, a judge should just take that extra five minutes of it again. I think that, uh, that's probably wrong because I don't, I don't really, like I said, I probably, I'm being, I'm jaded because I've been in the system so long, but let me tell you something, okay? You got a right to stand there. You got a right to be heard. And if you let that judge run over you, he will. Mm -hmm. And he'll do it for his convenience. So you how, how do you do it? You demand your time and you demand to be heard. And you do it and you do it strong enough you're going to be hurt, and it's and it's. I agree with Tanya that it's a listening problem, but you got to make them listen. Like I said, like I keep saying, they're not going to give it to you. There's good judges out there, but there aren't enough. So I, I, mean, I was saying that. I I I deal with this. I I'm the resident. I'm the only residential foreclosure judge in Broward County right now. I don't do what you are talking about, landlord tenant, which would be in county court. I'm in circuit court. But I deal with the issue you're talking about that I have to explain the law to tenants when their landlords, who are the owners, have paid the mortgage and now the property's been sold to somebody else. And I have to issue those writs of possession, meaning the new owner wants that property they bought. And the tenant, who didn't know that the landlord wasn't paying, well, I, I'm going to take that back. They know eventually because the tenants are getting notified. But they come into court and they say, you know, I, I don't have a place to go. But I still have to follow the law. And there are statutes and there's, there's uh, tenants, uh, very specific criteria. And I have had to sit and explain. Now, I've had cases. I've had to sit and explain. Tenant protection. And, and, and go over the notice they got that they ignored. And it said what they needed to do. So even as pro se as self represented litigants, the, the the law has criteria built in, but if you don't follow it, I have to follow the law. And if it wasn't followed in what they needed to do, I have an individual, unfortunately, 
took that letter, he bought it, ignored it, talked to his landlord who said, don't worry about it. And he trusted the landlord rather than right now he was one of the defendants, he was a tenant. And it was going to impact him, and I had to explain that unfortunately he had relied on somebody who shot, but couldn't take possession of. So I'm juggling a lot of different rights that I, you know, that people are. And yes, the tenant, I gave him a little bit of extra time than they wanted it that day. They had a 24-hour notice. And I said, well, I'm going to give you a little bit more time. But I mean, with law, my hands are tied, but I do. I'll explain the statute, I'll go over the statute with them, and explain here's why. You know, you're, you know, you're not classified as a bona fide tenant under, under the law. Here's why you have this time frame and, and this notice said you had to do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, you just had told me that you didn't do X, Y, or Z. And under the law, they have the right to the possession of the property. So reasonably, I'll give them a couple of weeks to be able to, because 24 hours, at that point in time, their head's spinning. So I might give them two weeks to be able to pack but so that's what I'm trying to say is that there's no balance. The landlord has been given the opportunity to do whatever. The tenant is not ignore, ignoring the document. The tenant is up under stress and about to be evicted. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is that there needs to be some balance. What changes can happen so that this landlord has done the things, some of the things wrong, nobody knows what he's done wrong, let's say code, code violations, let's say the landlord, the amount that they put on the document says that they owe this amount of money when they don't, but they, the tenant has to put that money down just because the landlord says it. What changes can be done to bring a balance? Because the tenants are not ignoring what they have to but do. Are you talking about changes in the law? Yes, it takes it. We enforce the law. We don't make the law. This right. is a conversation for your well, that's this what is my local elections matter. That's, that's, that's it. That's it. But you're asking. You have that is a problem. But you're at, we only enforce the laws on the book. That's why we have the judicial branch, the legislative branch, and the executive branch. We are <laughs> very local the laws. Congress men and women senator. They those are the ones that, that make the law. So that's the root of the problem. We have to follow the law. You see what I'm saying? So do you see that as a problem? That yeah. is a problem, but we can't so, we can't. So solve. from a point of view of being just a normal person, what changes do you think can be made? We can't talk about it. We can't, oh, can't talk about it. Well, well, yeah. Yeah. I got you. I got yeah. you. Because I knew it was yeah. some things you can't say, but you know. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you so much. Hey. And this is the doctor in there. You've had a hit a lot. Uh, no place else. Okay. Uh, what we're doing here today is awesome. We've had our candidates that have come. Good night. Good night. I know that's right. I got kids to kiss good night. Let's take a picture. Okay. And this is the doctor and I'm out of here.